At Bitcoin Magazine, one of our heroes is Hal Vinny. Hal Vinny was one of the first people to respond when Satoshi Nakamoto submitted the Bitcoin white paper to the cryptography mailing list. He was the first contributor to Bitcoin development besides Satoshi. He was one of the first Bitcoin miners on the network. And he was the recipient of the first ever Bitcoin transaction, which he received from Satoshi. But Hal was a hero even before Bitcoin. Back in the 1990s, he was a major contributor to the popular encryption program PGP. As a cypherpunk, Hal also developed and ran the first ever remailer, a sort of precursor to Tor that anonymously forwarded emails to help people communicate privately. And having promoted the idea of digital cash within techno-utopian extropian circles early on, Hal Vinny had in 2004 launched a digital cash project of his own, called RPOW. In the summer of 2009, just months after he'd helped Satoshi bootstrap Bitcoin, Hal Vinny was diagnosed with amyotropic lateral sclerosis, better known as ALS. ALS is a progressive, fatal neuromuscular disease that slowly kills the motor neurons, which carry signals from the brain to the muscles. In other words, it robs the body from its ability to walk, speak, swallow or even breathe. ALS can strike anyone and presently there is no known cause or cure. Halvini ultimately passed away on August 28, 2014. In honor of our hero Hal, Bitcoin Magazine is now raising money for the ALS Association. To contribute to our fundraiser or to learn more about Hal, visit bitcoinmagazine.com slash r-hero-hal. Hi everyone, um, my name is Michael Flaxman and I'm gonna be presenting a little bit on multi-sig security. So thank you all for joining me. Um, the guide we're gonna be going over is a free open source guide that's available at btcguide.github.io. Um, for those of you who are into the nerdy parts, it's a static site generated in Jekyll and pull requests are welcome. Um, so the basic thing that I've set out to do is build a multi-sig setup that has no single point of failure. Uh, and that's essential because that's what gives you fault tolerance. So in a normal setup, uh, if you make any mistake and that's the one that uh, leads to, to theft or loss, that's it. That could be game over and that could cost you your precious Bitcoins. And the idea is that we want to design a system that takes advantage of the power of multi-sig to make it so that you can make uh, one or more catastrophic mistakes and not lose any Bitcoin. Um, and so uh, that's exactly what the setup is. The default, the suggestion for uh, non-expert users that I'm going to be recommending is a two of three, um, but we'll go over how you could make it more advanced than that and, and stronger. Um, so to hop in, I'm going to share uh, the guide and let's hope it pops up right now. Great. Uh, it's showing for me. Um, could you all confirm if you could see that? Oh, I lost my video. Sorry about that. Okay, so um, so this guide here is the 10x security Bitcoin guide, and the the idea is to get rid of a single point of failure and 10x your Bitcoin security. Um, so there's a there's a, a main reason that we're going for multi-sig, and it's sort of to prevent this huge collection of different uh, both attacks and potential losses. Uh, we tend to be afraid that we're going to be the ones to be hacked. Um, much more likely is that we're going to lock ourselves out. Uh, but both are, are risks that we want to protect against. And multi-sig is fantastic in that it gives us this tolerance. 
Um, it also has a really good built-in um, system for inheritance. So um, I always ask Bitcoiners uh, when they tell me they have a secure setup for their Bitcoin, what happens if you get hit by a bus? Um, and the answer is overwhelmingly that your Bitcoin dies with you, um, which if you care for your family is is pretty harsh. Um, and so one of the really nice things about multisig is um, let's say you had a three of five, uh, you could control three of your keys and you could give one to family member A and one to family member B. And uh, then you would still have three. And of your three keys, maybe you put one in a safe deposit box uh, that goes to your family if something happens to you. And then you have this amazing setup where a family member A or B is not very good at guarding secrets. Maybe they're not a Bitcoiner. Maybe they don't understand this uh, technology. Um, maybe they struggle at logging into their you know, Amazon account. Uh, they can still hold a, a physical, say, metal seed offline, and they can have that uh, for when they need access. Um, and if family members A and B have access, and then um, a safe deposit box, for example, that would go to them if something happens to you, well, there they now have three of five of the necessary keys uh, to unlock your Bitcoin. But you don't have to worry about if if they get hacked or if they lose something. Um, so it, it provides this great um, natural mechanism for inheritance, which is pretty cool. Um, and then if you use multisig correctly, and that means that, say, no hardware wallet has a quorum of your seeds, then you're protected from all kinds of crazy vulnerabilities and edge cases that normally would require you to be like an expert user. Things like maybe one of your hardware wallets uh, isn't using the random number generator or isn't even using the firmware um, that we believe it to be running. And if, you, if you're an expert, you, know, you would know to, to load your own firmware onto the device. If you're a non-expert, you would just receive this device in the mail and assume that it's good. Um, and, and that could be catastrophic. But if you have, say, two of three devices by three different manufacturers in order to spend funds, then one of them could be complete malware, and that's okay. So you, you kind of transform what your interaction is like um, when, you, when you have a proper setup like this, because you're not concerned about like, well, there's going to be this one mistake and it's going to take me down. I mean, if you're securing $100 million, you're probably going to want to be really, really diligent at every single step and verify everything. Um, but if you're securing $100,000, um, which would still be for most people a, a horrific thing if they were to lose that money um, in an instant, you can you can kind of move through the steps more like a normal person would use a software product with the important caveat that if you're using uh, multiple hardware devices, you verify things on multiple devices. So you might have like a Kobo vault and a cold card. And when you go to perform an action, you check it in both those places and check that they confirm. Uh, in the example of a two of three, for example. Um, so, um, and multisig, I should say, has gotten a lot better uh, since this is an advanced audience. We can talk about some of the cool things. Um, so we now have BIP 174 PSPT. That support is getting adopted more and more places, and that allows more and more of the software to be interoperable. So while I recommend Spectre Desktop, I think it's totally kick-ass. Um, you can use Electrum. There's a new client uh, out there called Sparrow that I haven't tested thoroughly, so I, I don't want to give a recommendation in either direction. Um, but the point is that there are products like this that are just shooting up overnight. Um, Blue Wallet, fully noted, a bunch of these are playing around with PSPT integrations, and that's like a great, great thing to have these standards. Um, and multi-sig wallets now support them. You know, uh, Only in the last month can you even verify a receive address on a Trezor. Um, so that that's a really awesome thing. Um, and um, there were a lot of like weird things in the past that made multi-sig strange. Like we had these airdrops and you might not be able to get your coins if you were on multi-sig or it might be really hard. Um, we had expensive fees. Um, now we have the witness discount with SegWit. Um, so there's a lot of things that have just made multi-sig go from being like obscure and expert only to being awesome. And it's much better than Shamir's secret sharing scheme, which is a common thing that people have been using to get a multi-sig-like experience for many, many years. Um, but Shamir's secret sharing scheme has a lot of gotchas. And I would say like only for experts, only once you've maxed out your three of five. Um, there's a great post I've linked in here. Uh, I believe it's written by Greg Maxwell on Shamir's secret snake oil. And the idea being it's like easy enough to do and so, so hard to do right. So once you've maxed out your three of five and you're looking for uh, even more security, then you might want to start shamiring um, one or more of those seeds. But that's like a super advanced topic. Few people are there. Um, but if you're holding on to like nine figures, then then maybe that would apply to you. 
Um, so let's get into uh, the good stuff. So we got to pick a quorum. Uh, two of three is the default recommendation, and it's what we're going to be going over for this guide. Um, there's a lot of gotchas in, in even picking your quorum. So like a lot of people go from one of one, you know, a single SIG setup to saying, okay, I'm going to do multi-SIG, I'll do two of two. And what they don't realize is that they're now reintroducing a single point of failure. Because if either of those hardware wallets had a bug on it, it might not be uh, a, a hacker, it could just be a, a regular software bug, and they were unable to sign from that wallet, say the XPUB derived didn't match the seed, um, then your funds would just be locked. In a more extreme case, maybe your attacker is using a non-standard BIP32 path to ransom your funds back to you. So um, you know, you, you definitely don't want to go to two of two. You want some tolerance. That's where two of three starts to be exciting. And some people say, oh, two of three. Well, why don't I move to two of four? You know, give myself a little more redundancy. And um, for you know, an expert user, that that could work. Um, but you've now created this weird situation where you need four hardware wallet manufacturers. Because uh, if you used uh, two of the same hardware wallet manufacturer, so like two cold cards, two Kobos, two whatevers, uh, that would be a quorum for spending funds. So if you bought these devices and say they weren't running the firmware, the open source firmware that you believe them to be running, and you weren't loading your own firmware on because you said, you know, hey, I'm using multi-sig. I don't need to do the tinfoil hat stuff. I'll just trust this device to do what it says it's going to do. And then uh, these two devices were actually malware then they could generate um, two of your of your four keys might be keys that your attacker has. Now they still would need to know your public key information. Um, so it's not, you know, any one of these vulnerabilities does not guarantee loss by by any measure. Um, but you'd be putting yourself in a precarious situation. So two of four is counterintuitively not as good as you would you would think. Uh, three of five is excellent. That's like, you know, if you want to go to town, that is the gold standard. And four or five works, um, but now you introduce this new risk that um, you can only uh, lose one key. Um, and again, uh, more mo most people are more likely to shoot themselves in the foot than they are to be hacked. So uh, four or five is is pushing it. And you know, I I know Bitcoiners who like have evacuated cities where there's been um, floods or hurricanes, and that's real tricky. You, you know, if you're going to have geographic redundancy with your four or five, but also the ability to spend those funds then you're really in a tight spot. Um, so I would say don't don't mess with that. So today we're going to be talking about two of three. And let's talk about what the uh, two how, what you're going to need to build this two of three. So um, the good news is that these costs are very, very minimal. Uh, assuming you already own a computer, um, because of the additive nature of multi-sig security, you don't need to have a dedicated device. That is an advanced recommendation that you have a dedicated machine because um, you know there's a lot of incentive for malware to try to trick you, and this would be a prime point to do it. Um, but that said, if you're doing proper multi-sig correctly, then uh, your host machine could be malware infected. The whole point of these hardware wallets is that they're designed to not ever leak your private key. Um, but you know, we'd prefer the buffer of a dedicated machine. So any old low-end computer with a webcam. And then uh, for your two of three, I'm recommending one cold card. These guys are like uh, the OGs. Of, well, I was going to say the OGs of multi-sig. Um, Trezor has been doing multi-sig since 2015, but cold card does it really well. And they were the first to adopt BIP 174, the partially signed Bitcoin transaction standard. Um, and that's really pushed the industry towards everyone using it, which is really cool. So they're kind of like the, uh, the ones who've been doing it. For the longest and then the other one i recommend is this this is the um kobo vault and this one's sort of a surprising recommendation to a lot of bitcoiners it has some really obvious negatives it's built on android operating system uh it uses a secure element part of its firmware is closed source um and the attack service just being much much larger being that it's uh a, a, you know general purpose android operating system though they have hardened it it's uh, it, it's running you know orders of magnitude more code than something say like the cold card. What's so amazing about this device is the air gap. Um, it does everything via QR code and scanning, and that is a magical experience. And when you use that, you're like every hardware wallet in five years is going to be using QR codes and air gaps. And because of that, you never plug it in. Um, you install firmware via SD card, and then you never even use the SD slot. It's all QR code. Um, it really is a great air gap. So um, those are the two devices. 
And then the other heart, the other equipment is like really minimal stuff. I mean, um, you need, if you're going to be installing, um, Ubuntu, um, which is the recommended OS, but if you're savvy, you can figure this out on windows or Mac. Um, you're going to need a DVD, DVD, a, a writable DVD disc and a USB pen drive. Um, you're going to want more of those for backing up your pub keys, but, um, you know, this is not expensive and you don't have to do it that way. You could back them up in a cloud service if you're comfortable with your pub keys being there from a privacy perspective. Um, and then the, the kind of weird one is you need the cutout of your 2048 BIP 39 words. Uh, and we're going to go over what that would actually look like. Um, so you, you, you literally need a printer with two pieces of paper. Um, you could have a friend print this. There's no private information that, that's revealed in that, except that you're interested in Bit, Bitcoin security. Um, and my hope is that eventually these will come with every hardware wallet when you buy one, that people at meetups will be giving them out. Uh, it's literally just you know 2,000 words in a in, um, little cutout format that you can pull out of a hat. Um, we could even see them sold on Lightning Network, for example, the same way stickers have been sold. Um, so that's it for the for the requirements. Um, the really big one in all of this is that you're going to need to have a Bitcoin Core node. And so there is many, many ways you can skin this cat. Um, if you want to, if you're like an advanced user and you want to run your own Bitcoin Core node um, on the most minimal hardware, like a Raspberry Pi, uh, you could even have a prune node, although we'll get to some of the trade-offs there. Um, you could do that. So you could do this like really, really cheaply. Um, if you're not an expert or advanced user, I would say just use a product, you know, something like a Raspberry Blitz, Mino, Noddle. Um, it's going to be a lot easier for you. Eventually, um, we could see some hosted services with Merkle proofs, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but you're going to need a Bitcoin core node of some kind. Um, so you're going to either need to buy that product or have hardware that supports that, or just do it on your existing laptop uh, or desktop. Um, and that could be pruned or not, depending on your hardware space and your expertise. Um, and so uh, then if we go into more advanced equipment stuff, it's uh, things like you want something to store your Bitcoin seed on and paper is you know an option, but a much better backup would be to etch it in metal. If you're really fancy, um, you know titanium has a higher melting point uh, if there's a fire. Uh, but again, these all go back to your redundancy. Like if you're three of five, you might just say, wow, that's a ton of redundancy. Like I'll just use paper and put it in um, you know vacuum sealed bags, for example, and that'll be enough because it's going to be in different cities and they're not going to all burn down. You know, you'll, you'll have to decide uh, how you want to do that. Um, for backing up your public keys, if you're using pen drives, like maybe you want EMP bags, maybe you want fireproof bags. Um, you know, in safe deposit boxes, I recommend high shelves in case there's flooding um, and at least Ziploc bags in case the sprinkler system goes off. Um, and then um, when it comes to buying your hardware, um, this is another one where you can decide how paranoid you want to be. I would recommend getting the hardware wallets, if you can, directly from the makers at conferences or meetups. And that's the best way to guarantee your supply chain. Um, but they've got a lot of ways to verify the integrity of, of that device, and multi-sig eliminates a lot of these concerns. So you might be comfortable just buying from them online. Just do not buy a used hardware wallet from like eBay or a third-party seller on Amazon, um, because they have a lot of incentive to try to sell you a fake device. Um, yeah. And, uh, we'll talk a little bit about doing extra receive address validation. So you might decide, for example, that you're going to be three of five and you're going to keep your keys geographically spread apart. Um, and this does prevent some, some headache. You know, if, if you have to sign a transaction in three locations and maybe they're in three different States, well, that, that could be a problem. Um, but you might want that if, you're, if your use is that you just uh, stack sats and you're not spending, then all you need is to validate receive addresses where you can receive Bitcoin when you buy it um, and you don't need to spend and, and that might be right for you. But the problem you still run into is you don't want to have to like fly to three different states or countries to verify those three receive addresses on those three of five trusted displays. So you could use a dedicated machine like Raspberry Pi um, and put in all your extended pub key information, and then it'll be able to drive addresses. And you wouldn't want to rely on that solely, but you might say, like, if I'm doing three of five, and this device says that, um, you know, address A belongs to my three of five, and this device says that address A belongs to my three of five, and then also 
Um, I have a dedicated validation machine that's eternally quarantined, never connect to the internet. And it also says that address corresponds to the three of five. I might deem that good enough. Um, you know, if you're receiving a hundred million dollar payment, you might want to check out all five of your devices to make sure all five say the same three of five. But if you're receiving like, you know, a $100 payment, well, maybe it's just good enough. And one of the things that I like about both uh, Kobo and Cold Card and why I recommend them is that they register the multi-sig uh, quorum on the device. So they're checking that and confirming that. Uh, Trezor can validate a receive address, but it will not tell you, um, it, it doesn't have any way to keep track of the other participants. So it'll say like, I'm one of the three of five, but I don't know who the other four are. And that's true like every time you revalidate a new receive address. Whereas, um, you know, these guys, you register the multi-sig when you create it and you do want to be sure that like you're registering your actual extended public key information. Um, and then that's registered on there forever. And, um, you know, un unless some evil maid is swapping out your cold card, knows your pin and challenge phrase, and, um, you know, is really, really clever, um, they're, they're just not going to be able to change that. So that that's a cool feature that these devices have. Um, I'm told the BitBox O2 has this feature. I'm waiting on a demo unit to arrive, um, but I cannot verify that. Um, yeah, at least. So um, we've got our equipment. We're going to set up a computer that is watch only. And because it's watch only, we don't have to be like super duper paranoid about this. Again, if you're receiving a $100 million payment, you're probably going to take all this to the end level. Um, but for a smaller amount, um, you could say like, hey, the keys live on the device. This, this thing's watch only. And for that, you're going to need a Bitcoin Core node and Spectre Desktop, which is an awesome new free open source um, app that's written in Python. Um, and um, so I'm not going to go over too much detail how to install those because there's a bunch of guides and information. But uh, one of the great things about Spectre Desktop is it now has a one-click binary. So you know I build from source, but I'm a contributor to Spectre Desktop. Um, you don't have to do that, um, which is pretty cool. And um, once you get that going, uh, then you can set up your hardware wallets. And if, if a lot of this seems like overkill, one of the important things to keep in mind is that um, if you're verifying everything as you go, um, which for Bitcoin, you, you really should be, um, this doesn't present like new steps. This is a, a slightly different process, but you're going to, um, you know, if you're doing single SIG correctly, you're going to check that address twice before you receive funds. So that means you have to have that seed exist on, say, two different devices. And it's kind of messy because you're like using the same seed on two different devices. It now exists in two places. It could be hacked in either one and it would be hard for you to know. Um, better to just do it on two different seeds on two different devices and use the power multi-sig. And that is Bitcoin scripting language that um, ordinary users can interact with in the very most important of ways. Uh, so we may not have Turing completeness, or as I prefer to call it, Turing vulnerability, but we have these massive benefits of, of making Bitcoin the most securable asset in the history of, of humankind, which is pretty cool. So, so we're going to use that scripting language and we're going to interact with it. So we're going to set up um, our three, uh, in, this, in this example, our three uh, seeds. And we're going to start with the first one is a paper wallet. Um, and the reason we do the paper wallet is a couple fold. Um, one, uh, it's free. <laughs> it's free open source software. So you don't to get started, you don't have to start by buying three different hardware wallets. You can just buy two and then set up this as your emergency recovery key. Remember when we talked about that two of two case where uh, if there was a bug, you could be locked out. Well, this prevents that. And it provides you geographic redundancy. You could give this to say, um, you know, a family member who you wanted to get your Bitcoin if something happened to you. Um, so it has a natural transition path. Um, and uh, it, it's pretty neat because it also has the best random number generator. So this is going to be like even better random number generation than um, a hardware wallet where you have to trust that it's running that random number generator. So uh, you're going to be the random number generator and we're going to demo this now. Um, so this is seedpicker.net. It's free open source site and it's a lot like bitaddress.org if you remember that from back in the day, um, which is not a product that I would recommend anyone use. Um, but it's a similar concept where we're going to have a source of entropy. We're going to save um, the resulting, in our case, seed. Bit address was using a whiff for a single key. And um, then we're going to get an address, or in this case, an extended public key, and we're going to use that to receive funds on. Um, so uh, the really 
the, the preferred way to use this is to have like a, a monkey draw your words out of a hat. Unfortunately, I don't, I don't have a monkey. Um, so we're just going to use the generate sample button here. And uh, that is very dangerous. You can see it says only for testing. And I should say as a note on testing, we should do everything on testnet first. Uh, testnet is your friend. Testnet is free. You can go through this as many times as you want on testnet. Um, and testnet is like a fantastic resource. Um, you don't need to be doing things on mainnet and sourcing Bitcoin and potentially doxing your coins. Um, you can just do everything on testnet easily until you're really, really comfortable and then toggle to switch over to mainnet. And it's the exact same thing, only this time the Bitcoins are real. So um, I hit that button. We got 23 words, uh, super sketchy. We can't know if that random number generator I've never even audited the code for that. I have no idea how it worked. Um, and there's so much incentive for an attacker to substitute uh, their 23 words for yours. And and that attack would obviously be much more complicated than just substituting like a given 23 words. They might have uh, a word, uh, a list of like a billion different phrases and their random number generator would would cycle those in. And, and how would you know? Because, uh, you know, you'd have to test it um, at least tens of millions of times, which no human is going to do. Um, so um, if, if we were doing this for real, we'd be on an air-gapped machine. I really like Tails as a great operating system for this because um, it, it doesn't save anything to the hard drive and it wipes itself, including the RAM, from a cold boot attack by default. Um, so you know, Tails would be like our gold standard. But you could do this on a regular computer and just wipe it afterwards. Uh, if you really want to be fun and clever, you could like go office space on it and, and beat the crap out of the machine um, would be another option. But the idea is we do not save this information to any electronic means ever. We perform this totally offline. This is just a demo of doing it online. So in the real world, we'd go into our hat and we'd pull 23 words out and we'd write them down. Out of our 2048 words, we're pulling one word out at a time. We get these words. And what's confusing is that in a BIP39 uh, seed phrase, the 24th word is actually calculated. It's um, not totally random. It's, it's what's called a checksum. Um, and so it validates that you have a, a valid seed phrase. And even more confusingly, there are multiple valid seed phrases. So there's, depending on the length of your seed phrase, there, there can be many um, valid 24th or checksum words. Um, so this is just going to give us the first one alphabetically. So we pulled our, you know, assume we pulled these words out of a hat that we didn't get them by using the insecure method there. And we hit calculate. And immediately we get the public key information. So this is what's sometimes referred to as our XPUB, our extended public key, but this is in slip 132 version byte encoding. So this is a ZPUB because we're on mainnet. Uh, I believe it would be a VPUB on testnet. And the root key fingerprint, this is a way that um, watch only software communicates um, that you effectively communicates that this um, uh, pub key matches this seed when the hardware wallet has the seed. Um, and then the derivation path, this is this sort of standard Electrum um, derivation path that everyone's using. Um, there, We might see room in the future where derivation paths would become non-standard, but right now that poses some problems because um, uh, there are sort of like, there would be a possibility if your hardware wallet just let you use any BIP32 path that a clever attacker would ransom your change away from you by hiding it on a BIP32 path, which you can think of as like a nearly infinitely large number. And so you might have the seed that's used to derive that private key, but you wouldn't have the path to find it. And so then your attacker could try to ransom it that way. So there's a little bit of, um, I would say like, we haven't totally settled on a standard except that everyone just uses the Electrum one. Uh, TBD, if there'll be other BIP32 paths in the future, and that might affect uh, other things that could be built if we allowed other BIP32 paths. Um, but for now, everything's just using this derivation path and a very similar one on testnet. And so this is the info that we want to bring back to our Spectre desktop. This is going to combine with our other two ZPubs to create our, um, our uh, to, to register our multisig. And from that, we can derive nearly infinite Bitcoin addresses that we can transact, transact on. Um, so this is what we save. And there's a big old download button here that's going to just download it in JSON format. Um, and uh, I believe uh, Merlin is working on a QR code for this. So this will have a QR code too. Um, but what's really cool is that we got our 24th word here is build. So you put in those 23 words, your 24th word is build. Here's your full seed phrase. 
And you might say, well, this is really sketchy. Like, how can we trust this thing? It is open source. You could validate it yourself. But one of the things that's neat is there are a bunch of libraries that do the exact same function. And so I like a piece of software that's designed around the principle of don't trust verify. If, if this library were malicious and was trying to trick you, um, it would be hard for it to pull off the attack because every single person who uses it correctly should be verifying it. And if one of them caught it cheating, they would, they would have an incentive to broadcast. Now, in practice, it's a little slipperier than that. You still want to verify because uh, if you're a smart attacker, you would only launch the attack against the group that you somehow figured out isn't going to verify. So um, you might get it bundled for some in some like newbie library. And there, one in a hundred times, it, it gives the attackers a seed or something like that. Um, or depending on what the use case is, if it's generating it randomly, you know, give the attacker seed. If it's just applying a checksum, um, I'm not, well, I guess the hack there would be to show a fake XPub. You would show the extended public key of the attacker unrelated to the seed phrase. Um, so anyway, we're going to verify it. So we grab our whole seed phrase here. This is the full 24 words. And here is a free open source Golang library I wrote. Um, we paste in those words. Again, we'd be doing this totally offline on our AirGap machine. This is just for demo purposes. We run it. And it's going to derive this. Ooh, could not find. Oh, that's because I did the full 24 words. The dangers of live demos. Um, so I should probably have a better error message. but. Uh, here it gives us our 24 words. The, the last one is build, um, which matches. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, y'all can't see uh, that. I got to share the other screen. New share. And here we go. Allow. And get my video back. Sweet. OK. So. Um, just so y'all can see what I did, I'll zoom in here a little bit. Um, the first time I did not, uh, I entered all 24 words and got an error. But the second time um, I, uh, I got, I put in the 23 words and I got the 24th word build correct. Again, that was the, the first or alphabetically first word. Uh, there is a hidden switch in here for power users. If you wanted not the alphabetically first word, it doesn't really matter. Just go with the one that seed picker matches and then then they'll match and you'll feel good. And I also have open source Python code that will do this as well. Um, so you can validate not only that you get your correct 24th word, but that, for example, like these ZPubs match. So we'd hop back over to Seed Picker. Um, it's a little annoying to do the screen share, but um, I can confirm that this does, in fact, match on that screen. And um, that's that's really great. Now we know it matches. Um, we'd want to check the root fingerprint here and the derivation path. And um, we bring this info back to Spectre Desktop, and here's the format that Spectre Desktop likes. Or we could dump it to JSON. So um, so now we have our, our seed, and um, that was a, a lengthy one, but um, that's sort of the fun new one that's different in this setup. And let me go back to sharing my browser. Um, here we go. All right, browser shared. Um, and sweet. So um, this, the instructions are just going through this, practicing it with a dry run, doing it on seed picker. Um, and then we would uh, upload that file here on um, Spectre Desktop. And I can pull up what Spectre Desktop looks like. In fact, let's just add that key. Um, so we'll, we will add a new device. Uh, this is somewhat non-standard because it's not like a real device. Um, so we'll call this throw away demo, and uh, we're going to call it other. Um, maybe I should submit a pull request to Spectre to put in like a paper wallet as an option. Um, and I'm going to fetch the data from my Golang tool. But remember, we tested that this matched. So I can just like reconfirm right now that this uh, does, in fact, match seed picker. And the root key fingerprint is the same. And I'm looking at that path, and that's 48 harden, 0 harden, 0 harden, 2 harden. So that is the correct path. So I'd look at that and say, OK, that looks good. Continue. And uh, there we have throwaway demo as a key. Um, and so that's, that's what it uh, looks like. We could put it in other wallets. 
Um, maybe we want to verify this against like Electrum, for example, and put in all our pub keys into Electrum and confirm that we get the same addresses that way. Um, so that's pretty neat. So then we'd add our two other keys. Um, so if we go back to the guide here, um, the next step is um, the Kobo Vault. And just for time's sake, I'm, I'm going to skip through doing this part. But um, you know, we'd have this device here. Um, we update the firmware. Um, we generate the multi-sig on the device. And it all works via QR code, which is really cool. So it, you know, it would show on screen. Here's what our XPub info is. We scan that. And um, and sure enough, we have another device um, added. And um, then we do the exact same thing with cold card. If you're familiar with cold card, this won't be shockingly new either. Um, one of the neat things about this is that Spectre Desktop takes care of the awkwardness in the past around like how do you round robin into devices? Because every device needs to register every other device's um, public key. So the really neat thing that you know, Spectre Desktop's just purpose built and does things nicely. Everyone gives Spectre Desk or every device gives Spectre Desktop its extended public key info, and Spectre Desktop can generate back a file saying, "Here is uh, in the format that you use, so different for Kobo and Cold Card and probably future wallets as well. Um, here is a collection of a multi-sig for you to register and for you to verify on the device. Like, is this really the XPub that I want? And that's another good example of like Electrum. You know, I joke it feels like juggling uh, chainsaws with a blindfold." Like you can do it, but did you put in your public keys in the right order? And um, you know, and did you did that order match the way the hardware wallets are like round robining? Uh, very complicated. Whereas Spectre Desktop just makes it idiot proof. So um, for the cold card, there's a few more menu instructions. Um, this is a one-time setup. Um, remember that you're going through like settings and multi-sig wallets, and you're exporting the XPub, and then you import it into Spectre, and then. Once you have all everything imported into Spectre, you can then export it back out to your cold card. So that's all annoying, but it's all like a one-time thing. Um, so same idea, we get another device. Um, and now we have all three devices. So the last step is to what I would call coordinate the multi-sig. And that's where we're just going to tell it, OK, we want a multi-sig. Here's our M of N. Um, here's our, our three keys that we had from before. And um, we create the wallet. And this is behind the scenes going to hit our Bitcoin corner and register the wallet saying, hey, here's the wallet. Look for uh, transactions with these addresses. Um, this is where if you're setting up for the first time, it's very, very easy because you won't have any transactions. So you don't need to scan the blockchain. But if you find yourself in one of these like bizarre corner cases where you've done some transactions and now you're, you have a fresh Bitcoin core node that is fully synced, and then you create this multi-sig, well, then you have to re-scan it, um, which is a little bit annoying. Um, but sort of a hard to avoid thing. Uh, at least one neat thing in the um, script output is that we have a birthday. So um, in theory, you can direct your core node to only rescan from there. But um, you know that is sort of the, the nature of the trade-off with initial block down, download and, and Bitcoin core. Um, so now if uh, once we have this registered, we want to set it up on our devices. So once we have the multi-sig registered in Spectre, so um, we go into the settings, and there's just a show QR code for the Kobo. Very easy. You scan it on your Kobo, and your Kobo says, like, hey, is this the multi-sig that you want? Um, and you really want to check again, like, yes, these are my co-signers. These are my extended public keys. Remember, you only do this registration step once. Then it's saved in the secure element of the Kobo, and similarly, the cold card. Um, and so you don't have to recheck that all the time. Although if you were receiving a $100 million payment, and you're thinking, like, hey, maybe the evil maid has tampered with my cold card or Kobo and I don't trust this, then maybe you would want to re-verify it. Um, but uh, it's not a normal expectation or setting. Same thing with the cold card. You go into the settings and you download a cold card file. And this is where um, where Spectre Desktop just really shines because it, it just takes care of all the little idiosyncrasies and it just works. Uh, and it gets updated all the time if it doesn't. Um, so there you have your, your wallet coordinated on your multiple devices. And then um, the next step we're going to do is we want to see that our receive addresses work. So this goes back to the idea of our quorum. If we had a two of three and we only verified on one device, and let's say that device was like a Trezor, which is stateless, then the Trezor would say, OK, I'm one of the two of three. But who are the other two of the two of three? And so if my attacker is clever, 
Uh, they can be two of the two of three. I can be one of the one of, uh, I can be one of the two of three. I can validate it on the treasure that the treasure says, yes, this is a two of three and I'm one of it. And I go ahead and receive my, uh, you know, huge payment. And it goes to an address that is two of three controlled by my attacker. Now, this is only going to happen if, say, my computer is malware infected and the software I'm running is, is not genuine. Uh, but we don't want to rely on the guarantees of a, a host machine uh, that is a hot computer. That's the whole reason we have hardware wallets is because we don't trust our computers not to be malware infected. So, um, so we're going to verify. Um, and I would recommend on at least a quorum of devices, but this is a personal trade-off. If you're receiving you know, a $100 payment and you know that that cold card or Kobo has never left your site and you believe it to be an authentic device, maybe in the case of the cold card, you loaded your own firmware on it, maybe that's just good enough for you. And you say, okay, I'll check it on one. And if the address matches on both my Spectre desktop and my, uh, say, cold card, I'll say that's good enough. But that's obviously a personal choice. So we're going to verify it on all three. For the Spectre, um, it's really easy. It just shows you the address. <laughs> but you haven't really verified it because your Spectre desktop could be uh, malware. But it looks good. For the Kobo Vault, it's also really easy. This is where like Kobo just shines. So um, you open up your, your uh, hardware wallet. And you go to your multisig, and it shows you an address, and you can toggle through uh, for more addresses. And that should be the same address that you just saw on your Spectre desktop. Very easy, perfect air gap. Um, next step for your cold card. Um, unfortunately, right now with cold card, you have to plug it in and break your air gap. Uh, I'm hoping they'll add this functionality. There is a pull request in and a GitHub issue. Um, but for multisig on cold card, if you want to validate a receive address, you have to plug it into the computer. Um, it's not. As dangerous as that would sound, they do have like a, a wire protocol for how they send data. But you know, anytime you're plugging a device into a computer, it's sort of like your air gap is gone. Um, so that that's a, always a little concerning. And um, but sure enough, if you've if you've previously set up your cold card, which I'm guessing a lot of people on this channel um, already know how to do, um, and it's connected, uh, you can hit this this button and it will toggle to show the the address on the cold card display. Um, and so now you have two of your three trusted displays telling you that this address is the correct for your two of, is correct for your two of three, and you say, "Great, I can receive payments on it." But before that, um, we want to um, back up our wallet because this is our this is our moment to be safe. So here's where um, multi-sig is fundamentally different, and in a confusing way that it's really important to understand. Um, otherwise, you have a risk of loss of funds. So the really big thing is that in multisig, you need M of N private keys to sign a transaction, but you need all N public keys um, in order to um, create the redeem script. So uh, in the case of two of three, that means you need two of your three seeds in order to sign, but you need all three public keys and the corresponding um, uh, metadata. So that would be like your path, your BIP32 paths, and your root fingerprint. Um, although theoretically there's a way around that, but but really you just need to have it. Um, you could you could derive it from, well, it's complicated. Uh, you could derive it from the seeds if you have them, but in this use case, we're considering that you might only have two of your three seeds. And so this is a really common mistake that people mess up because they think instinctively like, okay, I have these three things and I only need two of three of them. So I'll just, you know, put them in three safe locations, like, you know, at home, at work, at a safe deposit box, buried in a mountain, you know, wherever they think of that only they will have access to. And they always think, well, if, as long as I can go get two of them, I'm good. But you need your extended public key information. So we want to bump, we want to back up that public key information in a lot of places um, because we need all, all N. So my recommendation is to save all N public keys with every single seed as well as potentially in other places. So with every single seed, keep a pen drive or a DVD-R uh, that's got your extended public key information. Um, and, and that includes a BIP32 pass, the root fingerprint, m and all of it, which Spectre just has a one-click export for. Um, but you might also want to store it in an online backup service, in an online backup service. Maybe you don't want that because then you're sharing your, your privacy info. You could store it with them encrypted would be another option. Uh, maybe you want to give a copy to your accountant or to your lawyer. Uh, maybe you don't want them to know how much Bitcoin you have. That's obviously deeply personal. But the idea is you want a lot of these public keys 
And keep in mind that your seeds might be etched in metal and might be really, really bulletproof and redundant. Um, your public keys might just be on pen drives, which have a much higher failure rate. Um, you know, those are not going to survive a fire flood at, at nearly the same rate. So uh, I would encourage you to be like massively over redundant in your public keys. So in this case of two of three, um, if you have two copies of each, um, uh, if you have a, two copies of uh, your of all of your public key information with each seed, that would be six copies. Um, and maybe you have some other copies laying around as well. So potentially a lot of copies. Um, but again, pen drives are very, very cheap. And you don't have to use pen drives if you trust cloud backup services. Um, you know, Certainly you can encrypt before using the cloud backup service, but then you have to store that password. Um, and remember that this public key information is just a privacy function. Uh, so obviously you don't want to lose your privacy, but when I'm thinking about the trade-offs, I am like 10 times more concerned about security than privacy. Um, although there is a correlation there because if um, you know a rogue banker drills the safe deposit box, finds uh, one seed, perhaps not enough to spend from, uh, but they do have one seed, and they have your public key information, then they're like, aha, I know you have X number of Bitcoins, and um, I know it's two of three, and I know I have one of the three. So like now I have a lot strong incentive to show up you know, and try to rob your, your home or your work or something like that um, in hopes that your other key is there. So, um, you know, privacy is a security risk, but it's a much, much smaller security risk than the actual seed. And if we compare this to like a single SIG setup where people store a seed phrase on a piece of steel in a safe deposit box, I mean, that's just game over if, if somebody gets that. So um, there is some issues with this publicness and um, part of that ties to the BIP32 path. If we um, allowed any BIP32 path, then that, that BIP32 path could be the secret in and of itself so that a seed wouldn't tell you anything. Um, but in the current scheme, if we all use the same BIP32 path, which uh, is mostly the standard um, for, for reasons that are a little longer to explain, um, then if somebody has one seed and, even, then they, and they know the path because we're all using the same one, then they can derive all of the child public keys that that seed could be a, a use as part of a transaction. And then under uh, SegWit, like P2WSH, pay to witness script hash, then at the time of spending any of your Bitcoins, you reveal all of your pub keys, even the ones you don't use. So if you do a two of three and you sign with A and B, um, but you still reveal the pub key for C, then somebody who finds seed C can derive um, X pub C can derive child pubs, C1, C2, C3, and see that, ugh, bad use of C, but they'll be able to, to look on the blockchain and they'll notice that, hey, this seed has a child pub key that was a party to this transaction. So I can see what it was a party to. Now, that was a spending transaction. So it's not like they can see everything, um, but they'll know that at some point, this seed controlled X Bitcoins. Now, maybe you spent that on and it controls nothing. Um, maybe you have massive um, uh, payments you've received that you haven't spent from, so they can't see those. Uh, it, it's, it's not a strong guarantee. Um, so that's, that, I would say, is sort of the big work in progress area for multisig is, is how to make that secret, because ideally, we would like that to be the case. And there are um, situations where it can be, but they have trade-offs too. So I think in the future, that's going to get a lot better. Um, but in the current version where we all use the same BIP32 paths, um, that is a slight negative, but there are so, so many overwhelming positives that it's just worth it. When it comes to backing up our seeds, that's the one um, that kind of makes sense. Um, we, we sort of intuitively get like M of N of these in really secure places. Um, and that really is magical. You cannot M of N your gold. You cannot have a three of five of any physical asset in the world. Um, you might be able to approximate it with like delegating trust to a bank or something where they say, okay, this is a joint account and you need two different entities to co-sign on it. Um, but full fundamentally, those assets live at that bank and they have 100% control. And, uh, you know, in the truest sense of the word, you don't even own it. You, you just have the ability to access it, hopefully. Um, whereas, you know, Bitcoins, I would say, is the only asset in the world that you can truly own, um, which is pretty unique in and of itself. And then it has this multiplier where, you can have this M of N on top of it. Um, so, so we tend to get that part. Assuming you have all your public keys and you know your M and N, you know, two of three or three of five for most people, you're just going to say like, can I always get to two of these? Can I always get to three of them? And you decide what you want to 
put where, uh, obviously don't keep them all in the same spot. Uh, don't keep them on you or someone, you know, can, can rob you. Um, but, uh, you have to decide what your, how, how you want to manage that. And then, um, finally we backed everything up so we can start receiving Bitcoins. Um, we already validated the receive addresses before, so that's real straightforward. And anytime we want to receive a payment, we just perform those steps. Um, let's say I've done that, and now I want to spend some of my Bitcoin. Um, it's actually really easy at this point. We did all the work up front, which is which is the hard work of multi-sig. We do everything up front so that we're set, um, as opposed to doing something sketchy up front and then trying to fix it later, which may or may not be possible. So um, we would just put in our recipient information, um, this is really cool because it's using Bitcoin Core for coin selection, um, uh, fee priority, um, even like address labeling and stuff. Um, so that's pretty neat. And um, we go through the steps of a PSBT or a partially signed Bitcoin transaction. So we first generate a transaction that's unsigned. And we can see here that it says it has zero of two signatures required because this was our two of three. And then we just go to our, our two devices and say, hey, sign. So, um, you know, we click on Kobo, pops up a QR code. This is the magic of Kobo for multi-sig. It really is quite good. And um, it pops up on the Kobo vault and says, hey, did you really mean to send X Bitcoin to Y address? And it's going to handle things like change detection and uh, even that calculation of X Bitcoin. You know, when we're sending a Bitcoin transaction, we're destroying inputs and creating outputs. And the net effect of that is we're sending X Bitcoin to Y address. So... Um, you know, Kobo, cold card, any any good hardware wallet that does change detection is going to immediately just pop up and say, hey, are you trying to send X Bitcoin to Y address? Uh, that's not the case, for example, if you use like Ledger. Ledger will just give you a list of outputs. And this is really, really dangerous because if you're sending, you know, 10 Bitcoin to, an, to uh, or one Bitcoin to somebody and 10 is changed back to yourself, well, you need to validate that the 10 that's going back to you is really going back to you. That could be going to your attacker. Um, and that's one of the terrifying things about trying to use Ledger in a multi-sig setup. Um, and then um, you uh, hit the sign button on your Kobo. It shows you a QR code. You you broadcast that back over QR code uh, over the camera to your Spectre desktop. And uh, next up, you do the same thing with Cold Card. Um, in the case of Cold Card, you could do it via SD or you could do it over USB. Here I'm showing USB, but Cold Card is uh, but SD card is preferred for advanced users. A better air gap. And um, when you uh, collect those two signatures, your transaction is going through different states of being like created and partially signed and eventually it's fully signed. And now we're ready to broadcast. You hit the send transaction button and it relays through your Bitcoin core node. Um, so, so that's it, sort of the end to end process. Um, it does seem like a lot, but it is really powerful in that you're, you're doing everything up front. Um, so that once you're interacting with your wallet, it's seamless and you get rid of things like having the, uh, what I call the cold storage sweats, where, uh, if you have to do something, uh, it's terrifying and interacting with your Bitcoin shouldn't be terrifying. And, and multi-sig is the game changer in this, because if you're doing, um, you know, two of three, you can make one horrific mistake where an attacker is trying to catch you and they still with only one key, can't do anything. And in the case of three of five, you can make two horrific mistakes. And these have to be horrific mistakes that also someone's trying to exploit. Um, so that is really a, an extreme level of protection and very, very cool. Um, so this is the way to do it. Uh, if you have questions, I'm at M Flaxman on Twitter. Also happy to take some questions now. Um, and it's bc, btcguide.github.io. Um, so, uh, Hold on.